it, it's so fun, and I, I feel like I love, I love the program that you suggested tonight because we're kind of watching the evolution of you as an artist, right, from one of the first films that you've made to then a failed pilot um, and to then something that, you, like, a work that you can't show. And so I guess I'd, I'd love to talk about um, your process of, of working through these things and how you decided to, like, to have your voice. I was basically just making it just for him because I, like, valued his opinion so much. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, he was great. This dude, Monteith McCollum, he made a great documentary about lawns. Um, <laughs> it was called Lawn. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and, like, yeah, so I, I, I made that, and, and, you know, it's it's got... Like, I was kind of a one-man band with that, too. I just never really, like, I just wanted to make, I, 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 what I fell in love with, with documentary was that I didn't need anybody else to make it, you know? It's like, you, like, when I would try to do, like, comedy, whatever, skit, narrative stuff, it was always, like, you gotta ask all these favors, and it, it's like, it's not even funny, and then... <laughs> <laughs> And then, but yeah, so it, 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 was, it was nice just, like, being able to, like, fully strip everything away and, like, like just make stuff alone. And it, it looks how it's supposed to look, you know? It's like, it's like I just remember watching, like, the Maisel stuff, like, when I was younger, and just being like, you know, it's like they waited so long to just get a camera that could sync sound and, you know, image. And it's like, and that's all I needed. That was it. And it's like, I don't know why anything had to change, really. Anyway. Um, but yeah, then I just started, like, making the how-to stuff. And I made that selling out movie, which kind of, like, makes me cringe at points. Um, still watching it now. But I think it's, there are parts that I still like. But but yeah, getting that getting rejected, it, like, really bummed me out. And it, like, but it was the best thing, I think, that could have happened, you know. Um, because uh, I would have made uh, it would have been total garbage if I had made a, like a network thing kind of by myself like in that style. Um, it, it I, I think like like Fielder and all the people that he brought on are like such incredible artists, and they like they really just like bring everything to the next level like narratively and like in terms of production and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, it's it's nice to be able to like pay people now, which is like why I feel comfortable like, you know, like expanding the production. Yeah, and um, I feel like I, I I love that notion just because I think there are a lot of artists that are trying to create work that do face a lot of rejection. So how have you been able to push past that? Because I think that shuts a lot of artists down. And, you know, I love how successful your show has become, and it's, it's really amazing, but can you maybe walk me through, like, how you've dealt with rejection in the past and how you stayed, like, true to yourself to keep going? Well, yeah, I mean, I would, I would submit, like, Lunar to festivals to get rejected over and over again, you know, and it's like, and then I would, I did learn my lesson after that. I would still try to submit things to festivals after that, and I would just, I would not get in, and it's just like, and the ones I did get into, there would just be this competition, and you're competing against these projects that are nothing like yours, but they're just like all part of, you know, this, like, whatever program. And most of them are so bad. And it's just like, it was so, I don't know, it, it, it bummed me out a lot. And I just like, I, I, I didn't want to engage with that anymore. So I just like totally cut that out of my life. And I just, it's like, you're spending all this money submitting stuff. I mean, you know, any filmmaker here, you know, knows. Um, and then you're just, you spend all this time in just this holding pattern, just like, okay, I can't premiere this thing because it's got a, I want it to premiere at this place, but like, it really makes me upset when I go to a festival and I see this movie that I want to share immediately with like all the people I love and I just can't because it's going to, you know, whatever be out on like, you know, Quibi or whatever, like, um, or I mean, whatever <coughs> movie, maybe. <laughs> um, but so yeah, I just I, the the experiment was to just like put just make the stuff alone, like self sufficiently, and just put it on the internet the moment I was done with it. And if it was if people liked it, then it would like succeed. But if not, then I would just I would learn the hard way. But it would be cheaper. 
And I feel like you have such a unique lens to which you view this city through and, and your work, you know. And so I'm curious, what inspired you when you were younger and what comedy were you drawn to? And are there other filmmakers that you really loved that you were maybe wanting to emulate? I really like that movie Dirty Work. Bob <laughs> <laughs> <Bobby> McDonald. <laughs> yeah, 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 some, some dirty workers in it. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, like younger, when I was younger, it was like I think more immature stuff. And then like once I graduated college, I realized that I like I wasn't really where I wanted to be and like I, I just looked up to all these like kind of other filmmakers around me and I just like and that's when I started working for the private investigator and I like would spend all that, my free time there which is like most of the day just like wa just <laughs> watching as many just like niche documentary and, and kind of like you know like it, whatever like films that I could just to like I don't know <laughs> Just catch up, and I mean, yeah, I mean, specific stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, do you remember the first film that like left an imprint on you, and you were like, "This is cool. I want to be part of this." Hmm. I don't know. I mean, the first, uh, I, mean, I mean, the first DVD that my dad brought into the house was *Strangers in Paradise*, and that that was like really great. Mm -hmm. at, like when I was younger, because it's like, oh, each. Each like scene is a single shot, and it's really funny, and it's like so achievable, you know. And and, and I, I liked I, I, that was inspiring. Yeah, and you know I I definitely relate to that idea of of you know when you have to do it yourself, it's easier. It's hard to rely on people sometimes, and and film can be such a collaborative. Um, involvement, but now you're working with like an incredible team of people, and and so how has that shifted how you approach what you make now? And do you enjoy it? Do you want to go back to the old way? Is there room to do new things? Um, I really like it. It was really tough at first because it's like so autobiographical, and there would just be moments where I would just like break down in tears, like with Nathan in the room because I was like going through a breakup, and I was like trying to somehow channel that into the work while he was trying to yuck it up and, and it was like uh in a good way i mean it, 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 like we, we dealt it was like a very intense therapy kind of session that nathan like <laughs> and i had when we were making the small talk episode um anyway but yeah it's but all the people that work on the show are just like such incredible artists you know like leia and nelly and um like all the people that that like the second unit shooters and and they notice things that I would never ever notice, and it's just like the best thing in the world to to like I sh I shoot all day like on the first unit stuff, and then I come home at night and I just watch 100% of what they shoot, and then I just make selects from that, and then I just like put it into a big disorganized timeline, and that I kind of power scan through every single day, um, and yeah, it's awesome. I don't know. I I, I was worried at first. And I had like a bit of an ego at first that needed to be like that, like Nathan and everybody else, like really just just beat out of me. <laughs> and I'm really, really glad they did because like I, it's not the same thing. And but it's like authentic in a different way. I I, I feel. Yeah. And the way that you work. Well, what I kind of love is, is how inserted you are in your work, right? Like, it's your perspective, your voice, you're the narrator. Um, and we talked about this a little bit last night, like, kind of, like, how, you know, Velasquez was the first person who, like, inserted himself into an artwork. And so why is that important for you as a documentarian? And has it had, like, a cathartic healing um, for yourself? Because you've mentioned, like, not enjoying your own voice and all these things. And so how has it helped you become a more like, secure human, in a way? Um, it's made me more secure, I guess, in that, like, knowing that there's, like, a kind of a shared experience with, with a lot of this, like, stuff that, it, it, like, bothers you throughout the day. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I, how do you start that question? <laughs> <laughs> like, why do you like putting yourself in your work, and is it cathartic for you? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 like um, 
it, it is really therapeutic and it, it's it's like I can't tell if I'm creating like if if I'm solving or creating problems <laughs> you know for, for myself in the show I, I, I think that I'm like I'm doing a bit of both but yeah I don't know it's like I, I, I get really upset when like when people someone came up Multiple people have come up to me and said, I was like, did you really buy that house? <clears throat> Which I, I, like, there was a whole episode about. And I was like, and I'm like, yes. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? Like, what, what kind of, and then it's like, what am I doing wrong? You know, it's like, well, like why, why does it seem like I didn't buy the house? Like, um, but it's like, that's my real, like, Cat, that's my real ex. That's like, like, it's like, yeah. like. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, because I just like. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm, 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 I'm gonna. I, I'm, I'm excited to like one day not have to like put a hundred percent of, of, of like, of everything on the table, you know, for the work, but. Like for the time being, it, it is, it does feel good, but it, it it is really exhausting, especially when like things in your life change. You know, it's like I had a girlfriend at the end of that last season, and like we were breaking up as like I was editing it, and it was one of the biggest nightmares, and like as bad as you think it would be. Yeah. Um, we like figured it out, but it was like something I I never really want to do again. So I feel like that's intense, like to be channeling so much of yourself into the work. And so, but do you think that that you would be able to work without including yourself? Because I feel like what's so special about your work is that it is so personal to you, but but then it relates to everyone. And I think that's one of my favorite things is how relatable this show is to people of our age, older, younger. There's like this common subthread because I feel like you see this world that everyone kind of wishes they they see, you know what I mean? And so I mean, we'll see it, right? Yeah, but you're the one capturing it. It's it's not really being captured in this way. I think yours is maybe the first show that is is so unique in that. Like, and you just go off on these tangents. And it's wonderful. Um, so yeah, so I'm wondering, like, like how that is for you to to create. Um, yeah, it, it's. I feel like I've been in a lot of like, I have. I've been in a lot of really boring environments throughout my life <laughs> that I've like put myself intentionally in. Like, like the, the the work that I would do for for money was usually just like I I would I would only pick stuff where I could just emotionally vacate and just be like you know a like technician in a way so that I could put all of the energy like into the work and. Um, I don't know, but that like it, it also in that stuff informs the work in, in a lot of ways too. I feel like I'm getting on time. <laughs> I mean, how does it like I don't know. So I'm in these boring environments, like in, in infomercial or just like these these like in these offices that like have no I don't know, and, and I just kind of like force myself to enter to entertain myself like within these spaces and the spaces begin to transform. The longer you're in them, and and like when you're in New York for long enough, you know, uh, you just begin to notice new things in order to kind of keep yourself entertained. I think like one of the things that's really interesting is just like your comedic timing, because I feel like you know in watching these, there's kind of like a sad thread, but then it's like so funny, and like some things are really sad, but I feel like it's it's your pacing and the way that you're looking at it that keeps it moving. So how did you learn to work with that? Um, yeah, that's where, like, so much of, like, the editing and the scripting, it just, like, you know, like, every, everything is just, like, written within the edit, and, you know, people give me shit for having, like, a, a halting voiceover, you know, <clears throat> but it's, like, that's the length of the shot, and, like, the timing of every single word is, like, is extremely deliberate, and, like, what you hear and what you see, like, has to be, like, down to the frame, you know, and, um, yeah, so like that that's where that kind of style came from, but it's also it's like memes, you know. It's like you know, you see something and you hear something that's like a text that betrays it or something. 
and I love like that you still like you get pleasure I feel like from watching your work like I liked hearing you laugh while you're watching it and I feel like so do you think that that's like a marker for you to keep creating because you actually like derive pleasure and joy from this and would there be a point that maybe you would stop if like you weren't experiencing that anymore I don't want to stop because like I mean I I'm just like so the, the, the impulse to make any one of these movies is usually just like I this doesn't exist out in the world and I want it to exist so I don't think that will ever stop you know like I just I wanted I don't know I just at a point I was just like looking around I was just like how is nobody else doing this exact thing this seems like the most obvious thing it's got all the coolest stuff in it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it was it was a struggle at first to like when we were making the pipe the small talk pilot, like he we were just like, okay, what has to what has to what do we have to balloon, what do we have to just like what has to stay the same? And we realized that it, basically everything has to stay the same, like formally, like structurally it's fine, it, and it just has to be in HD. Um, <laughs> but he brought on like the his executive producer, Clark Ranking, um, his editor, Adam Lock Norton, who he grew up with, and Adam edited all of Nathan for You. But I basically like, <clears throat> I like, when we were making the pilot, it was, like I was saying, I was being really stubborn, and I wanted it to just be a little like less like uh, narrative, I guess, but it was just getting kind of messy and Nathan is just so good with the story and knowing like how to like have one character kind of like piggyback off of another. Like if, if, if one person says something, then that can kind of trigger something in, in, in my mind, you know? And like, so we would just have these long conversations after I would shoot something like, what does this scene mean? And like, like what could this like trigger within me to like make me spiral or like come back down to earth um but yeah uh he's also just like a magician at the same time and there's so many things happening in his show and this show that you don't realize like like aren't quite as they seem but are more or less what they are i, I know i'm being vague here uh without specifics but like He's just uh, he's just really good at story stuff, and that was something I really suffer with because I don't like read that much. Like I don't know, fiction. <laughs> like <laughs> anyway. It, it I guess it depends on the person. It's like usually like the in, the, the interview style. There's not really that much of a style, really. Like. Some people just want to talk, and like it's like when you're talking to someone at a bar and that doesn't shut up. <laughs> you know, it's like it's the same thing. But only I'm holding a camera, and um, yeah. And then some. Sometimes I'll say, "Wow," when I'm kind of speechless. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, in, in terms of like getting access, like. Sometimes I'll meet someone on the street and I will have the camera and I will say hello and then maybe slowly raise it and within a couple seconds you can tell if someone is, is okay with it or not. And if they are, then you kind of continue to raise it and you land like <laughs> kind of near your eye and then, <laughs> then you like start a conversation and then maybe, and then maybe they invite you in. Um, and sometimes they tell you to bug off and that's fine. But most of the time, like the the relationship is is like very like clear. You know, I I, I got, I'll say exactly what I'm doing. Like, you know, I'm making a movie about scaffolding. Uh, would you like to talk about that? Or uh, you know, it depends on what the episode is. But if I if I if I meet somebody, um, and I'm like in their house or something. I'll usually talk about six episodes worth of content with them, and then you just see like the part that works. 
for the episode. So when I'm editing a lot of them, like each interview can can play for multiple things, but it just depends on like what whatever the most profound like kind of snippet is from that. Uh, uh, great question. I, I, feel like, I, I feel like that that is a, a, a much that is like a <clears throat> there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> because yeah, I, I I mean you're seeing whatever rises to the top within the edit. You know, there's so much that there's nothing happens and it's like and there's no coincidence. But um, yeah, I I often feel like a bad luck charm in a way where like I. It's like everywhere I go, like a building collapses. <laughs> <laughs> like, like a fire is set or something like that. And I don't, I don't know, at the beginning of like, I'm, I'm, I just started like doing season three last week. Like I just started like, like writing some stuff. <laughs> And, thank you. And, um, and at the beginning of every season, I'm horrified because I know a bunch of crazy shit is about to happen. I just don't know what it is. But just by being kind of a Mr. Magoo out in the world, I will witness it. Um, but it just, and I'm always afraid. Like, I was nervous. There's no way this is going to happen again. There's no way we're going to, like, lightning will strike. Like in the, in like with the frequency that it did in the last season, you know, and that's how I felt at the beginning of season two. But then it just did, and I and and part, I mean part of it was me literally just walking into people's houses uninvited. I, I think that's not coincidence as much as it is just like kind of dumb perseverance. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I I, I don't know, <laughs> uh, um, I don't know how it works. <laughs> yeah. Me? Yep. Um, hey John. How um, do you balance when you capture some of those more outlandish things that you have in your show, how do you find that good balance in tone where it feels like it's acknowledging how ridiculous something is but not necessarily judging? Yeah, it's it's um yeah, I mean I that's <laughs> Before the show came out, I, I thought it could, I thought the audience could have gone either way with it. I, I didn't think I, I couldn't I didn't know if they were gonna think it was like like how they were, anyone was gonna receive it. But like tonally, it's a very delicate dance, and it's like it's it, that's where most of the, the energy is spent in the edit. Just like when you're looking at the shot, <clears throat> what you're saying like has to that just has to be the right joke. I don't know. It, it, it I, I don't know how else to like put it. Like if you're you just make sure you're never punching down, and you know if, if something insane is happening, like just the joke has to be about like me or us, like at, at, like at, as like the, like as as humans, like it, it it should it should never just like be like look at this like weirdo or something. It, it's it's like not like that like that that the, the, there's like no joy in kind of the cruelty of, of, of humor like that, you know? And I've seen people make, like, knockoff, I mean, well, maybe not knockoff, but their own versions of, 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 like, this style, and it's, like, really easy to get it wrong, because when you're too literal about what you're saying over the shot, then there's no joke. And, or, or, or it's just, like, just misery with, with, with like, no other dimension to it. I have another quick question, if you don't mind. Okay, well, how's yeah. this? Okay. Very quick. <laughs> how far do you walk in a given day when you're filming? Um, I don't know. <laughs> like, I should get a pedometer. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't quantify anything. I don't even. I don't even know how. I can't even look at this room and say how many people are there. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Um, I have not, I don't think. What are some big titles? I guess, like, one that I would think of is the Owl Lady. Like, it's about this, like, woman and her husband that, like, cared for owls and stuff. 
No. And then like this is Montreal not to worry about like skateboards in the sixties and stuff. Oh, it's, it's like cool. No, it's yeah, it's all on you. Okay. Uh, but I guess yeah, what's uh, what's like a favorite documentary? Um, I really love that doc, like, um, Wildwood, New Jersey. I don't think you've ever seen that one. It's, it's like, on the Metrograph app at the moment, just in case anyone is a member there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Oh, cool, cool. Oh, yeah, right, I, 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 they, 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 they did get their hands on it, right? They like, because the, the only thing, the one I've seen is like some VHS copy of it. But yeah, it's just like about this like vacation town in Jersey and like all the women that live within it and like their relationships with each other. Um, it's really good. But I mean, one of my biggest inspirations is is like Louis Theroux, like, you know, BBC guy. His interview style is just. You know, he, it's it's definitely different, but but the the the, the kind of the, the space that he gives to his subjects is, is, is something I really admire. Yeah. yeah so we uh, there, I basically have like a dispatcher in the like production office, and I meet with him every morning, and I. I have like a long scavenger hunt list and we look at what is on it and what has been shot. And then what we don't have, I then, we just like look at the map and it's like, okay, there's probably some version of that over here. Or we also have someone that is just constantly looking at what any events that are happening in the city at any time. And if this second unit people don't have somewhere to go, then we'll just send them to an event. And it's just like, that's a good place to start. If and don't necessarily shoot the event, shoot like what's on like the edges of the event and then like and then move radiate out from there. Um, yeah, it's kind of like but most of the time it's like go to this area that nobody is in. It's like the opposite of a cab dispatcher. <laughs> um, just because there's probably some signage that we've never discovered. I, I just I really want to be really thorough a lot of the time with um, with you know, the areas that we cover, because there, there, there are covers that, have, I mean, there are areas that have been kind of shot to death, and, and, and I just don't, like, I don't really, you know, like, I, like, my, I, I think they, they got, my second unit teams got upset with me at one point, because I was, like, looking at all the footage, and I was like, guys, no more parks, don't go in parks anymore, <laughs> like, everyone in a park is acting like they should in a park, <laughs> like, <laughs> if that same activity was on the sidewalk, it would be so much better. So, like, just try to, and I know it's harder, but it's more, you know, rewarding. It's just, yeah, I have a hard time explaining it, too. <laughs> I was at a hotel the other night, and I was, like, I, I like, um, was talking to this guy, and I was trying to explain to him what it was, and it went really badly. <laughs> but, like, when I said HBO, then he got really excited and started like, <laughs> talking about this other show he was watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's you know it's 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 collage. It's like it's I mean it, it, it does share language with like meme stuff I guess. But like you know for for if if, if they they have no other reference really I I really don't know. Um, but yeah, I usually just. I don't know. I I just there's just a there's like a hidden joke inside of everything, and you just got to and that's what the fun of the material is because you know you see so much of this material on TikTok or Instagram or whatever stuff like this, but it's just all decentralized, and you know I can see this stuff and I'm like oh this is so good but it's gonna disappear I don't know where it's gonna end up like I, I don't know how anyone's gonna see this in the future, and then. Like, <clears throat> but like the footage itself, like when I shoot something, I'm really happy with it, but then there's just always a second layer that it will, will kind of really make it shine, and, and that's where like all the fun comes, the fun comes from. Yeah. Hi, John. That first yeah. film that we saw, you mentioned earlier that there was an, another concept and you discovered the balloon thing. Yeah. I'm wondering what the original concept was. <clears throat> I just, there was like this, Strip club in Binghamton. It's called um, oh, what was it called? Little Darlings, maybe. 
No, that's a chain. <laughs> it was, I don't know, it, it was like this, it was the most cinematic looking strip club I've ever seen. It was like under a highway, no other building around for miles. And it was just like a real kind of Sin City kind of thing. And I was like, okay, I want to make a documentary about this. So then I started going there and I'm just like, I, I don't know, just like, and I was like, this is boring to me now. Like, just, I feel like other people have made stuff about strip clubs, and I'm not really, like, get it. There's nothing really interesting. I'm really pulling out of anybody. But then, then they told me just randomly that they're having a balloon party, and <laughs> I, my ears just perked up, and I started to make the balloon thing. But then the owners of the strip club got really angry with me, and they like locked me in a room and told me that they needed to, I needed to make the movie about their strip club because I thought this is gonna be like a press piece for them. And then I was trying to explain my way out of like I was trying to say like, oh no, it's about both of you. <laughs> but then one of the strippers came to the door, uh, which the guy had locked and then like kind of interrupted us and I was able to like get out. And that's when I stopped filming at the strip club, which is why I most of the end of the doc ends ends at like the the main guy's house. <laughs> I'm kind of off the clock at night a lot of the time because I usually just shoot with natural daylight and I get a lot I, I, I feel like I get a lot out at night that I I like seeing this way it's like any boring place becomes interesting and I, yeah, I, I really never want to shut it off, and I think that's why I'm like trying to force people to see the world this way in little ways too, just because like I think it's 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 I think it's good to be perceptive. Otherwise, you're just like I don't know. It's like not not really like like getting the full picture a lot of the time. Which is fine. You don't have to. You just like get on the train. <laughs> time for one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you with the, the hair. You, you yeah. Hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was like, not 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 any of the stuff that you obviously that, that you you mentioned, um, like that, all that stuff I felt was like very humanizing and stuff, and um, I just like I could relate with like. If I can relate with it, then I'm like, you know, I want to put it front and center a lot of the time. But there was the <clears throat> the one thing that was difficult was the the sex offender that I met um, on um, Randall's Island. Uh, he like he told me about what he did, and I like had it in the edit for a second, but I was just it just felt like this is we don't need to hear this, um, and I, I, this doesn't really, like, make this part stronger, and I think, like, um, yeah, so that was something I took out, just because it was already, like, a very, I think, kind of difficult scene to watch, um, but also, I find out stuff later, like, I don't know who remembers that episode, but I talked to another guy right before I talked to the sex offender guy, who I'm just asking about Randall's Island, but he also turned out to be a sex offender, <laughs> and he, but he didn't tell me. He was just talking to me. And someone on Instagram DM me with his like mugshot, and <laughs> like, that's how I found out. Anyway, um, so yeah, there is some, but most of the time it's like I'm I'm into like just showing what other people don't want to show. Thank you so much for being here.